Support for the Trailblazers.fm podcast comes from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, a vibrant network of leaders and organizations working on the ground to drive positive outcomes for our black men and boys. To learn more or to join and help CBME change the narrative, hop on over right now to tbpod.com slash black male achievement. You're listening to the Trailblazers podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Trailblazers.fm. We are celebrating Women's History Month by highlighting four trailblazing women for the month of March. And if you're joining us for the first time or you missed a couple weeks, you definitely want to go back and listen to Kamika Smith, founder of the Boss Network, who kicked things off this month with a discussion about the importance of building meaningful relationships. Then last week's episode with Cheryl Wood was Amazing. Cheryl talked about how we can begin to leverage our story to begin getting paid to speak publicly. And she shares tips and wisdom on how she went about building her seven figure empire. Definitely want to go back and check out last week's episode to hear that. And so, continuing our focus on amazing black women, I went all the way back home to Jamaica to feature someone I've admired and have a ton of respect for as a truly creative trailblazer. Blazer Nation, allow me to introduce our featured guest for today, Miss Yendi Phillips. Telling you about this woman might be an episode onto itself. Yendi is truly a work of art, right? She's an ambassador, a beauty queen, businesswoman, a dancer, a mother, a social media influencer, a model, and the list goes on and on, guys. Yendi has accomplished what many only dream of doing in a lifetime by winning two national pageant titles and going on an international stage to make historic feats. She's only the third woman to hold both Miss Jamaica World and Miss Jamaica Universe titles. And in today's conversation, we talk about life before and after her pageants. She gets honest and transparent about the biggest lessons that she learned from both. Uh, She talks about how the experiences of being a beauty pageant contestant impacted her in her walk to now being a businesswoman and a creative and a mother today. We talked about what's worked to cultivate her social media influence and grow her personal brand. And despite having hundreds of thousands of people following her on social media, she opens up and shares what's helped her to find inner happiness and stay present when there's so much happening around her. There are many episodes that we've done on this podcast where either I knew that I had an objective or the guest had an objective. Today is not one of those. I have literally been trying to get this interview for some time now, and it happened very last minute. And so what you hear today is Yendi in her truest form, being honest, transparent, flawed, and God-fearing. And I really hope you'll enjoy this episode as much as I have. Yendi is all of that, but she's hilarious at the same time. And so that said... Let's dive in and access today's Mission Fuel from our featured guest, Miss Yendi Phillips. Enjoy. Yendi, welcome to Trailblazers.fm and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. So, as I was saying just a minute ago, I've been following your journey for like probably eight years now. Going back to, I think you were initially like really making a run on social media and up to the Miss Universe run, I believe. And I've just kind of watched your journey, you know, post pageant, watching you kind of figure things out and becoming a mom. And we have kids kind of close enough in age. Really? So I've, yeah, I watched your journey. You know, Layla is, Layla is seven now. Okay. So yeah, I kind of just watched. <laughs> and it, it sounds so stalkerish, right? <laughs> but I've just watched you through social media as you've grown into this amazing woman and this creative business mind. Oh, and, thank you. And so I'm excited to have you here and, and to have a chat with you. And so one of the things we love to do on the podcast is kick things off 
really from a place of gratitude. Okay. So I kind of wanted to open things off and have you share an unexpected blessing in your life right now that you're really grateful for. <laughs> well, I tell you what, the question was unexpected. So I'm like, wait, wait, oh, 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 oh. Wait. <laughs> so an unexpected blessing. I think I've been having a lot of those with um, over the last... I'd say 18 months to a year. I've delved much deeper in my spiritual journey and my faith. And so God has been working very mysteriously in my life. So I literally have, I would say, I don't think I have a week or two weeks that go by without something very surprising and unexpected happen or move in my life. So I don't know which one to give you. I mean, I just have so many. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) I got a phone call recently about a global initiative that is happening. I I didn't even know that these people knew I existed. And very soon, I'm going to be signing something very major, which is so massive for me that I just sometimes can't even understand why God is so good to me. So I wish I could tell you exactly what it is, but we'll stay tuned. (laughs) Yeah, There's something global coming that I'm really excited about. That's neat. That's really awesome. So I'm going to take us back for a little bit because there are people who are listening to the conversation who probably are meeting you for the first time, right? Right. So one of the things you and I share is we were both born and raised in Jamaica. And so I wanted you to maybe tell us something interesting about how and where you grew up in Jamaica. So I grew up in Kingston, which for some reason, like when you travel and you said everybody's like, oh, everybody grows up in Kingston. (laughs) um, (laughs) Not quite. But no, I grew up in Kingston, but both my parents are not from Kingston. So although I went to school in Kingston, every single time we had a holiday or break from school, we were off to the country. So we're either in St. Mary or Clarendon or up in the hills just below Blue Mountain. And I think both my parents really enjoyed getting out of the city. So Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing about growing up for me that was really nice is that I had a really great balance of city life, but country life. Both my parents, their sides of the family are from St. Mary. My mother was actually born and raised in St. Mary. Uh, So are mine. Really? Now let me find out our family (laughs) neighbors. (laughs) But yeah, so I think that side of me speaks a lot or that experience speaks a lot to who I am in terms of I don't know I really love nature I love the great outdoors I am the first person that's ready for a road trip (laughs) I really enjoy you know just discovering the unbeaten track especially here at home yeah so what was the big goal growing up right was pageants and dance and these creative titles part of the dream of a young Allende You know what's really strange is I remember vividly my mom asking me what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I just remember saying a star. I don't really know what I meant when I said that, to be very honest with you. Like I I just remember that that those were the words that I used to say. I can't quite explain to you what that meant for me. I just knew that I saw people on TV and I just knew that they were a star and I wanted to be a star on TV. Or I just knew I saw people performing and I was in love with Michael Jackson and I was in love with, you know, Elvis Presley. I would see him on TV. I remember watching Elvis and me every single day for a summer on VHS till I'd tape the ribbon of the cassette. Um, I just remember that he was a star and I just liked that. And I couldn't quite define it as a child. But then I guess as I grew older, God kind of put these little desires in my heart of, you know, opportunities that would allow me to have an impact and platforms that would allow my voice to be heard and allow me to make a bit of a change where I could. And um, so Is that what inspired the pageant? I believe so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then I also, if I'm going to be really frank, um, I also understood what, if I was successful in the pageantry, I understood the doors that it could potentially open for me as well. Yeah. When I was in college, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in dance. So I've always mm-hmm. been a dance and I love dance and performance. But then I have a Master's in Entertainment and Recreation and Leisure Management Studies. So mm-hmm. I kind of merged the two worlds of entertainment and performance and business and management. And I just knew that I was going to do something along that path, but I I really couldn't quite put my finger on what I would do exactly, to be very honest. I'm very right brain. I'm very creative. So I knew it was something. You're creative, but I hear so much strategy in what you're saying right now. That's just because I've grown up now. That's only because I've grown up. (laughs) But even then... (laughs) 
But even then, that's awesome. So one of the unique things, unique accomplishments that you have to your credit right now is that you've placed in both the Miss Universe pageant and the Miss World pageant, placed in what, the top 16 in 2007 Miss World, and then went on to place first runner-up, them the Rabio of the <laughs> of the crowd. You said it not me. <laughs> That's another conversation mm-hmm. for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but in Miss Universe 2010, mm-hmm. right? Are you the only person to have woman to have had such success in both runs in both campaigns? I don't believe so. And the only reason, and I'm, I'm not going to like roll out some statistics here because I really am not sure. But I know that in my yeah. Miss World competition, there the young lady from Dominican Republic. She was also in the top sixteen, and she also hmm. did Miss Universe, and she was also first wow. runner up the year before. Wow, yeah. so that's amazing. But only Jamaican woman, probably. That is. Actually, no, I believe Sandra Foster placed in both as well. Yes. Really? Wow. She did. <laughs> so there are some amazing Jamaican women that represent us, right? And I look at, I imagine there's still people, right, who look at pageants and they question the yeah. value of them and the women that compete in them. But I look at your accomplishments, right? And I can't help but probably think, and I'd love to poke at you to maybe share some of the bigger lessons that you learn from both and how the experiences of being a beauty pageant contestant impacted you as this now amazing creative businesswoman and also mother. The thing is that pageantry is very subjective. It's very objective mm-hmm. and it is very surface. It is. So you are looking at physical beauty and everyone is going to have a different opinion of the physical but I think with advancements and with evolution there has been a bit of a shift where it's not just about physical anymore I think there is still a lot of uh, there is now rather a lot of weight placed on intelligence a lot of weight placed on a composure a confidence it's not just being a fickle fly-by-night Oh, I'm frilly. I'm pretty. (laughs) Look at me. It's not like that Mm. any longer. (laughs) Not that I think it was ever that, but I think that was the public's perception of what they once represented. And I think it's safe to say, um, even with Miss World changing its mantra to beauty with a purpose, that is self-explanatory. And even with the connections of both competitions doing work as it relates to World AIDS organizations, as it relates to hunger organizations, working with UNICEF and other organizations globally, I think the perception has maybe somewhat shifted, but there are those who just believe that it's all about external and not much weight and doesn't carry much value. But it definitely is. Mm-hmm. It is about image. I would be lying if I said it's not about image, but I think there is much more to it now. I think that's maybe what sells it in terms of viewership, but there's so much more substance to it. I think so. I definitely think so. Um, especially what you go on to do once you're reigning, because then they go, oh yeah, yeah, you look good. Here's a sash to wear across your chest, but then so much more happens after the fact. I mean, being an ambassador for your country is something that's massive. When you have to speak to heads of nations and, I mean, obviously it can't just be because you have a pretty smile. You know what I mean? You have to be able to represent your country. You have to be able to hold your own in a room with dignitaries and leaders of the world. So obviously there is much more substance to it. And a a large part of what I think I gained from it is there is something really lovely about representing this little island, Jamaica. And while our people can sometimes, we can sometimes be extremely critical of our own and sometimes, you know, especially with our athletes who compete and if they're not successful, we kind of, you know, sometimes we get a little too rough on them. But when they're successful, we're right there waving the flag and jumping up behind them. You know, we we do have that tendency, but we also have such a passion that is undeniable in the Jamaican person. And when you represent Jamaica and you excel at representing Jamaica, the type of support that comes behind you is honestly unmatched and it's hard to quite describe. So that's been um, quite a bit of a thing for me as well. You know, it's just the the amount of support that I was able to garner Mm -hmm. and the amount of doors and opportunities that have opened for me and the confidence that I feel knowing that my country was behind me. You know, it's very empowering. Wow. So even before the pageants, you talked about your love for dance, right? You studied dance and you've danced with NDTC, right? The National Dance Theatre Company. Yes. And you have your own fitness workout DVDs Mm -hmm. and you've experienced tremendous success in that both nationally and internationally. As a creative and a dancer, 
You don't always see clear paths, right, to being able to monetize that passion. Right. And so what was your first branded deal that made you realize that you could actually make money doing your own style of dance and creating your own product? Well, to be very honest, that started way back. When I was at Edna Manley College, I was awarded the NDTC scholarship, which... Ah. Thank God I got because otherwise I would not have been able to pay for school because in my first year of Edna Manley, my mom had passed away. And so a lot was happening in my family and there was just no way that I was going to be able to stay in school or finish school without that scholarship. So Professor Rex Nettleford was actually a lifesaver in that regard, but he wouldn't have known it until I'd explained that to him, you know. But I remember when I was finished at Edna Manley and I wanted to go on, because at the time Edna Manley College didn't have a degree program. They only had a diploma program. And I wanted to go on to complete my dance degree. And I remember... I was doing workshops where people would pay to participate in the workshops in order to raise my money to buy my plane ticket to go to school abroad. Because again, I was granted an exchange program scholarship. So Mm. I got to go to university in New York without having to pay a cent. I just had to find my airfare to get there. And I remember putting on the workshops and trying to raise money. And I remember I knew someone who knew an international dancer and I, you know, got the dancer to come here. I got a sponsored airline ticket and I got the hotel to sponsor his stay. And I remember he putting on the workshops so that I could earn money to buy my ticket to get to take up this scholarship offer in New York. And I was just like, you know what? There is real business to be had out of this. Yeah. Because in Jamaica, unfortunately, in the world of entertainment, you either ask to perform for a stipend, unless you're a, in a band where you're, you know, you're backing an international artist, you're, as a dancer or as an actor, you're often asked to perform for food. You know, you know man, just come and perform and we, we'll make sure you have lunch. Like, uh, it's a profession. It's an art. Yeah. So you really do have to think outside the box in terms of creating opportunity for yourself to monetize and create income. And I remember when I was finished studying in New York and I came back to Jamaica, you know, professor was just like, okay, time to come back to the season. And I was like, you know what, prof, I understand that, but I need to (laughs) make money because I'm a professional dancer. And it's the same way you wouldn't ask a doctor or a lawyer to come and do months of work for a stipend for the love of You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're remunerated justly for their services because they can do something that no one else can do in the same way. I don't know how to lay tiles. I don't know how to put a ceiling up. So, and I'm not going to ask a man to come and lay my tiles or put up my ceiling to give him lunch or a stipend because that's his livelihood. And it's the same way for artists. It's our livelihood. So unfortunately, we don't have a culture here where it's seen as a profession that deserves just remuneration. And so we often have to Mm -hmm. think outside of the box to create income for ourselves. Hence the dance dance fitness DVD, hence the dance workshop classes, hence just really trying to think outside the box to monetize it. Mm -hmm. So you've created these different products and services now. What is it that you love most about working with clients in fitness? How they feel. The way they feel after really makes me feel good. When you see people feel good, you feel good. You know what I mean? Like the glee on their Mm -hmm. faces, the endorphin high that they experience, just the freedom of the movement, the freedom of their expression with their bodies. And the fact that they keep coming back, I'm just like, well, obviously something is right. And obviously they're happy. So it really feels good to see their feel good. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, once you said they come back, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's a challenge for us to just get going, like to get started. Right. Like what is the thing you've seen people all over Jamaica and Canada and everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. What's the thing that you think is holding us back from getting fit, getting in the gym and actually staying in there? Excuses. I think it's just yeah. easy. Yeah, it's, Mindset. it's excuses. It's easy to be, we're too busy, I have too much time, or the kids, I need to get this, I, need, I just don't have time. And I mean, if you were to flip the script and say, okay, you are unwell, you are unhealthy, you are sick, do you have time to go to the doctor? Do you have time to take the medication? Do you have time to get the treatment? Flip it around. Do you have time to spend half an hour a day, instead of waiting in a doctor's office for half an hour, do you have time to spend half an hour a day moving so so that you don't have to end up in a doctor's wow. office for half an hour. So mm. I think it's just that we we make excuses. That's just the truth. Because even right now, I was supposed to run this morning and I've said I was tired and I made an excuse and I didn't run. And now I feel bad because now you're asking me and I'm like, 
gosh, I'm actually guilty myself. <laughs> <laughs> we all just, I mean, it's hard sometimes because we have so many things that we need to get done. Adulting is not easy, but I think mm -hmm. it, when we look at the perspective, it's better to spend half an hour on ourselves now than having to be spending months in bed unhealthy and unwell. Truth you speak. Well, I only speak so, the truth and I speak it ever. <laughs> <laughs> so you just touched on this. You are such a busy bee, right? You're always going. What's some of the habits that you've figured out, that you've developed, are really are helping you to take these outcomes, turn these outcomes from good to great? I have to make lists. I make to-do lists yeah. every single day. That's like my number one habit. Otherwise, I forget everything. I will not even lie to you and try to pretend that I have it all together because I don't. <laughs> so I have... The end what? <laughs> no, you don't even understand. Remember, I'm a creative, I'm a right brain person. Yes, so that's right. organizational skills are not my strong suit. And I'd be in complete denial if I was to think anything otherwise. So yeah, no, my habit that I think I've developed, which is a, which is a good one, is that I make to-do lists and I go through them every day and I start my morning with my morning prayers and my meditation. I make my to-do list. Mm -hmm. I drink my glass of room temperature water with lime or lemon for ye foreigners. <laughs> I have um, my lime <laughs> juice in my backyard. Someone does get lime. <laughs> and I write down a to-do list. And then at lunchtime, I check off what I've done and I edit what I need to do and I if if I don't do that list even it's a wrap it's over no problem. what big time big they done <laughs> habits that I've developed that have served me well my to-do lists mm, wow so before I kind of want to flip the scripts here in a mm -hmm. second but before we do I kind of want to come back to this with the creatives mm -hmm. right I'd love to tap into some wisdom from you there are so many starving artists out there and so many people have amazing talent, but for some reason, I can't seem to get out of neutral, right? Right. What would be your advice to the creatives listening who want to start their own side hustle or their own creative business? You have to just start. I think that's probably the hardest thing as a creative is that, well, for me personally, I am such a mood and vibes person that I just be like, mm, no, not in the mood. No, the vibe not right. Or, <laughs> and I just delay, delay, delay. But procrastination really is one of the ultimate killers in yeah. business. And I think as a creative, sometimes we procrastinate in the name of vibes and the energy not mm -hmm. right or and I think number one is you just have to get up and get it done you just have to start you have to start you can't make excuses you can't save it for whatever day you just have to get up and start and sometimes I think we all have ideas and you know funding the ideas is very difficult and sometimes you have to end up doing a little hustle or a side thing that you don't want to have to do but right. you do it because yeah, then that creates the funding to then go behind what you ultimately want to do and right. to be very honest when I started doing my master dance classes it just like I was saying with my school ticket the airline ticket it wasn't because I wanted to be doing master classes or workshops it's because I needed the income to buy the ticket right. to go to school is when I started YMDC which is the end of master dance class it wasn't because that was my first option it's because if I was able to do this and I could fund the project then I could fund the DVD or I could fund the you understand what I'm saying so you map out your path and you just work in work in a plan really to get to where you want to get to absolutely yeah. one of the hardest things when you're a creative is finding the funding for your idea it's hard to get investors to buy into your idea and you know sometimes it's hard to sell your own idea to someone else sometimes we have to step out of our comfort zone to find a way to create the income or create the funding that we need to prepare and push what it is that we want to do and love to do sometimes you have to be a little uncomfortable to get comfortable yes i love to say that <laughs> i love to tell people they need to jump off their cliff of comfort yeah and yeah. You know, to be able to soar higher which doesn't make sense Absolutely. but for the few that do they get it so let's talk about personal branding for a second right i'm a marketer i'm a brand strategist mm -hmm. and i admire when i see successful people successful at building and growing their personal brand and you've definitely done an amazing job at that you're now you. you know a social influencer with a, a pretty big footprint across facebook and instagram and I, i'm curious to know what you've found to be successful ways to 
cultivate your influence and grow your personal brand? You know what, to be very honest with you, I didn't think of it like that at first. Really? I Yeah, I was just sharing my journey. So there's I, authenticity that allowed you to grow? I think so. I genuinely think so. I was just sharing my what my days would look like or what my... I have a few passions. So I love the arts. I love creativity. Yes. I would share when I would go into the dance studio and just play around with my friend. And friend. Around. <laughs> yeah. yes. And I'd just be like, yo, this is bad. Yo, we need to record this, post this. Yeah. That was that. <laughs> it's not because I just turned up there because, oh, we need to create content. No, I uh-huh. was like, yo, I want to move. Let's let's uh-huh. play. What's that, what's that popping song? Let's play around. I would come up with something. I'd be like, yo. Oh, this is sick. <laughs> and then I love to travel yeah. because I've always wanted to see the world and explore the world. It mm. is sometimes not easy to do because there are budgetary constraints. And I was just mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm going to share my travel. And sometimes I'll share little ways of how you can do it cheap and how you can get little mm-hmm. deals or, you know what I mean? Before I turned 30, I had this idea where I wanted to travel to 30 cities in the calendar year that I was turning 30. And I ended up just taking pictures everywhere I went. And at first I wasn't sharing it or posting it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to post it and share it. And so 30 days before I turned 30, I posted a picture from every city in my 1330 journey. So it just is, I'm sharing my true experience. This is really what I do. This is, this is me and my kid on my way, carrying her to swimming. This is, this is what our life really is. And I think people perhaps appreciate the authenticity of it. Yeah. That's what I say. I mean, I feel like I've followed your journey through these posts yeah right and i feel like i'm connected i'm watching izzy grow up and i'm like man like you know it's amazing to me you now seeing her and and thinking back to baby pictures of her it's yeah. just interesting how, how fast it's these it's kids grow up it's right killing me yeah. i'm in too fast <laughs> very stressful but yeah i know that they are posting her with like no teeth and i was just like look at her she has no teeth like my kid yeah. has no teeth and i was just like wow i remember when she really had no teeth before (laughs) and now (laughs) she lost the ones she had (laughs) and so you've been able to carry that forward right now i see that you found ways to monetize and you'll do some ads maybe via instagram right or or facebook how have you figured out a ratio that feels right to post content that's you versus maybe you know an ad here or there Well, the thing is, when I'm approached to do just that, any influencer Mm -hmm. marketing or anything, I explain to them immediately that it has to be on my terms. It has to be Mm -hmm. a genuine, I don't work with or endorse or promote anything that I don't actually consume, experience, be a part of. I just don't. And so, for example, a couple of the partners that I have, it's because I had gone into the store I had made a purchase and I had shared something about the purchase or I will make something in the kitchen. And when I'm showing up, this is what I'm making in the kitchen and I see the products that, is being, that are being used, they're like, oh, she uses our product. And I'm like, yeah, I do. This was in my cupboard mm. because I wouldn't, I don't believe in sharing or pushing things that you wouldn't actually do for yourself because it's not true. It's not a real representation. Right. And it's, it can't just be about money. You know what I mean? I just genuinely believe that there has to be authenticity there. And so there have been things that I've decided not to be a part of because, for example, I don't drink soda. I don't. I've not had soda since I was in college because my dance teacher said really? soda is awful for you. Yeah. So I don't drink soda. And I was approached by a beverage company and I was just like, thank you for your offer. I really appreciate what I can't because I don't drink soda. I'm not going to say mm. I drink soda and tell anybody to drink soda because you shouldn't drink soda. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think that because of sharing what I really do and my true experience i think there have been a couple of brand alignments that have formed but it's formed mm-hmm. from a genuine place not from a place of this would be good so let's force this to happen if that yeah. makes any sense absolutely does i really i don't eat mayonnaise and i use yogurt i use plain greek yogurt everywhere that i would use mayonnaise and that was seen and then mm-hmm. the outcome was, oh, we could do something here. And I was like, of course, please, because I don't eat my So that felt natural, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. So we're getting close to wrapping up here, but there are a couple other questions I wanted to ask real quick. So much happening, again, around your everyday life, work and dance and, and being mommy. How do you stay present and stay grounded in all of that? My faith. 
Absolutely my faith. Yeah. I have a relationship with my God in the same way I have a relationship with my partner or my daughter or my father or my family in the same way that I spend time with them. And I, if, if a couple of days go by and I haven't spoken to my dad, I'll be like, okay, I need to call daddy because I haven't spoken to him. Mm. I don't allow that to happen in the same way with my maker. I make sure that I spend time. I spend time in the word. I read my Bible a lot. I spend a lot of time in prayer. I spend time in my praise and worship. I mean, everyone has their way that works for them. And mm-hmm. that's the grounding factor for me and the hold it together, keep it together factor for me has absolutely been my faith. And wow. I will not lie to you when I say if I didn't have the Lord, I don't know what I'd do. Because sometimes mm-hmm. it can be very difficult, especially when you're in the public eye. You face a lot of criticism and sometimes mm-hmm. you make decisions that people aren't fond of and they don't hold back you know and sometimes Mm -hmm. onslaught comes and you just have to I I have to I really then at that point I'm just like you know people these people don't know me but Lord you know me you know my heart you know you know me I'm a child of God empower me with the tools I need to get through this this dark valley you know and I would be lying if I didn't say he pulls through every time (laughs) <laughs> yep. He pulls through absolutely. every time. So my grounding factor is absolutely my faith. I know that my work here is not about me. I know that God has purpose mm. for my life. I know that God, I've always, from I learned the word indelible, I've always said, Lord, what is the indelible mark that you'd like me to leave? And empower mm. me to be able to leave that indelible mark that you have destined for me and my life. And I think he's doing just that. And I would, if I would think that this is about me for a second, then I would have this thing all twisted. It's not about me. It's about God's work and God's purpose for me and my life. And he's obviously chosen each and every one of us for a reason. And I believe strongly in living up to that reason and that purpose. I have chills when you say that because I, I feel so, I feel that in the work that I'm doing, even in this podcast, you know, and being led to kind of start this platform. And it's the first thing that I've ever done where I truly feel like it's so much bigger than me, right? the impact that it has. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing. And and God bless you. That's amazing. You You touched on something here just a second ago Mm -hmm. that I kind of want to bring you back to. Okay. Because I feel Mm -hmm. like you have developed a sense of maturity now to being able to handle the cyberbullying and the criticism that comes from, you know, having this type of platform, right? There are benefits to it. There are also the negative sides of it. How do you handle and what's your advice to, especially, you know, we have some younger folk listening, right? right? That may be subject to that. Our own kids might end up being subject to that, right? What's your wisdom? What do you want to pour out to others to say, hey, you know what, when this comes, This is kind of how you need to step into it and handle it. Well, the thing is, it used to really bother me. It used to Mm -hmm. really, really bother me and hurt me. And it's not once, it's not twice. It's actually, I can't count on my hands how many times I've ended up in tears as a result of reading something. But I've read something from a stranger who does not know me, who I do not know, yet I have ended up in tears. And... The thing that I have really had to digest and assure myself about is I don't know this person or these people. They also don't know me. And the opinion that they have of me cannot be a paramount factor in my life. It just cannot. And if there is something that is said that strikes a chord with me, I then turn to the people who are nearest and dearest to me, who I know will give me an honest opinion and give me genuine feedback. I turn to my father, I turn to my three best friends, my partner, and I would say, this was said, do you think there's food for thought in this type of a comment? Or do you think that there is something here that I need to look into? And they will be honest with me. And if there's nothing that I need to look into, if there's, if it's an absolutely abstract comment that has no weight in water, then it stays behind me. And I, re- it took me so long to learn to do that because I'm very sensitive. Um, I am so sensitive by nature. <laughs> and I just had to almost mantra myself to a place of, you know, the opinion doesn't matter. It's, it's not valid. It's not the opinion of someone that, you know, wants to see me advance and wants to see me grow. So unless their intent for me is for me to be my best version of myself, I don't need to hear anything that you have to say. So I think my advice would be, do not give weight 
to individuals who don't even know you and know who you are. Turn to the people who are nearest and dearest to you. And if there is room for improvement and room for growth, listen. Take the constructive criticism and better yourself. If there is nothing positive that can come out of it, dismiss it, compartmentalize it and move on. People who do not know you cannot be given so much um, leverage and weight in your life. They just can't. Love that. Yende, we can't finish this conversation without me touching on your role as a mommy, Mm -hmm. right? And the lessons you've learned, right? What's the best advice that you would want to give to other parents on raising awesome kids? There's no book on how to do it. There are no rules on how to do it. (laughs) And everybody, it's so... It's such a subjective rule, parenting. And I genuinely believe that we all have the innate gift and the God-given ability to raise our children in the way that we ought to raise them. And sometimes when it's overwhelming, because Lord knows it takes a certain type of patience that only Job possessed, then you need to turn to your source of strength. If that is your confidant or the person beside you, or if it's prayer, and you ask for the strength and the guidance. I think even when you have more than one child, you know, each child is so unique and different, take a different approach. And I think I genuinely believe that we, our gut instinct will tell us just what to do and the right thing to do. I think also we have a lot to do in terms of listening to our children. I think there's so much we can learn from our children if we just don't think that we're the know-it-all adult. There's so much they can teach us. They can teach us so many life virtues, patience, understanding, compassion. Even when you, we observe how children play and the way that they interact with each other, I think sometimes socialization has either made us move away from our innate way or hardened mm-hmm. us sometimes. Even in the way that, you know, children play in a sandbox, they don't say class, they don't say color, they don't say social status. It's I think there's so much that we can learn from our children and just maybe even the lack of judgment that they have for each other, you know? So I would say they are our teachers as much as we are their teachers and trust your gut instinct. Yes. I love that. I love all of that (laughs) that you just shared. I also would add, and I I see this with you, and I think I relate to that so much, is that you're present. You're present in your daughter's life, right? You're so active. And I am a firm believer in your presence, Mm -hmm. not presence, not gifts, right? Not material things, but actually being active, in their lives and couldn't agree more with all of those points that you shared. Well, the best gift you can give each child is time, isn't it? Absolutely. Without question. I didn't grow up wealthy at all. I mean, my parents really did not have it easy. And I didn't feel like I was lacking as a child and it's because my parents were always there. My father was on a Friday night. You know, some people can't be found on a Friday night, uh, you know, cut him off a door road. (laughs) And my father was like that. He was home with his children because he was at work in the daytime. So he was home with his children. And once it was weekend, it was our time. My mom, I mean, I have so many amazing memories. And to be very honest, I wasn't, I didn't grow up in a family that, you know, traveled on a plane every holiday. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my child has an experience and a life that I dreamt of. You know what I mean? That's probably why she has that experience now because as a child, I wanted so much to see the world and I wasn't able to travel and fly as a child because it just wasn't in our family's budget. But I didn't feel like I didn't have anything. I didn't feel like I had less than my parents who were flying all over the place or going Mm -hmm. to Disney or because my parents gave us so much time. We just had a lot of time with them. I have amazingly fond memories with my parents and it doesn't include toys or material things or yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Those memories don't go away, like no. the material things. Even speaking to you now, one of the first things that comes to my mind is I remember my parents put it on a sprinkler and all of us had on our swimsuits, including my adult <laughs> parents. And we're all jumping up and down in the front yard in the sprinkler like idiot. And we take a garbage bag and slash it and make like a little water slide thing go down the front yard. And we were sliding down the front yard. And it's an extremely fond memory of my parents that didn't take money. It didn't require anything excessive or exorbitant. It was just their time. They gave us their their time that's on my, my bucket list of things to do this summer <laughs> just please make sure it's not a speedo please for the sake of the kids don't let the kids friends see you in a speedo i'm begging for mercy <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> all right so there are two last questions that we ask all our featured guests okay. before we wrap up right mm-hmm. And our Blazonation loves to hear our resources that 
our guests use, right? So are there any good books that you've read recently that you'd care to recommend? Well, first of all, I am the <laughs> biggest bookworm and nerd. Are you? So, yes. Hello. <laughs> I post some of them, not all of them. Oh, well, one of my favorite books that I've read is a book called Heaven is for Real. It's about a little boy. What was his name again? Oh, man. I think his name was Colton. And... He had an experience where he passed and came back to life. A true story. It's called Heaven is for Real. That's very good. I've read every single Dan Brown book ever written. So I love Dan Brown. He's the author of Da Vinci Code. He's the author of Angels and Demons, Lost Symbol, Deception Point, Digital Fortress. Uh, yeah, I love him. <laughs> what else? Actually, one of my, I really love Paolo Coelho as well. The Alchemist yeah. is a really good read if you haven't read it. But he also yeah. has a book called Manual of the Warrior of Light. I don't know if you've ever heard of Never it. Heard it's of it. very good. Yeah. It's a nice book where you can pick up each morning, open a page, read a page, and just, you know, just reflect on it. It's really a very good book. Yeah. So by Paolo Coelho, it's called Manual of the Warrior of Light. That's really good. Yeah. What else? Let's see. My brain is letting me down here. Oh, <laughs> good. <laughs> Age is not easy. My brain isn't as sharp as it used to be. Oh, da, 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 da. All of what? <laughs> Listen, hold up now. Not quite yet. Give me a few months. Come on now. Not quite Come yet. on. <laughs> I would say those are some of my top ones. Awesome. So last question for you. Mm -hmm. What's one action that you think our community should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Oh, why you got to be so deep? Um, <laughs> <laughs> hold up now I mean isn't that the type of question that you like ask presidents jeez okay. one action that our community should take this week that would help them to blaze their trail I think every day for the week when you wake up if you don't already do it I think spend 15 minutes in prayer spend 15 minutes with your makeup Ask the questions that you need to ask. Listen for the answers because they will come, whether you would actually hear the answer, whether it will come in the form of signs, whether it will come in the form of people that you'll see who will deliver a message. I think once you're acute to it, you will receive the message that needs to be received. I feel like we often get so caught up in the hustle and bustle of our daily lives that sometimes we forget to be still and be silent for just a few moments. So I think spend 15 minutes acknowledging your maker, giving thanks that you have breath to breathe into your lungs, giving thanks that you have the gift of life and asking your maker what it is that he wants for you to do with your life or this week in particular and sharing your needs and watch him manifest and watch things unfold in your life. Yes, love that. Love that. Andy, thank you so much. Tell us how we can stay connected to you and tell us about what you have coming up that we can take part in. Well, you can stay connected on Instagram. I am Yen Dizzle, Y-E-N-D-I-Z-Z-L-E for shizzle my nizzle. That's Yen Dizzle. On um, Facebook, I'm Yendi Phillips, two L's, two P's, because my family just extra like that. And I am launching something very, very soon. I've done a soft launch of a faith-based a parallel line called Odyssey by Yendi. It's to inspire each person's journey as they go through their own journey and their own odyssey. And yeah, there's a range of shirts, mugs, candles, and other apparel. And I've done a soft launch in Jamaica, which went so well. And it's going to be globally launched very soon. So if you check out Yen Dizzle on Instagram or Yendi Phillips on Facebook, the website link to that should be there. Um, hopefully by when I said it will be and when the <laughs> developer said it would be. <laughs> but more important. I will link up to all that yeah. on our show notes page for you. Okay. So we'll have all the links for all our listeners over at tdpod.com. Awesome. So. And Yendi Phillips, thank you so much. Appreciate having you on. Thank you, Stephen. My pleasure. 
Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'll be posting links to all of today's book recommendations and links mentioned on our show notes page at tdpod.com. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content, and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers.